Well, we'll get started here, being on time, and get everybody back to their Fridays and get to the weekend. Uh, my name is Lisa Beck. I'm a clinical nurse specialist in our spinal cord program. Um, my colleague, Dr. Dan Rowe, will be joining me in this lecture, and we will move along. We have nothing to disclose, only that we have a really cool video to show you at the <laughs> end. Um, and there's really no off-label use of the video that I can think of. So, <laughs> so our objectives this afternoon um, really is uh, twofold, really describing the value of patient-centric care model, using it in the development of patient education materials, and even in our service and programs as we um, advance our practice throughout in the future here. Um, identify sexual concerns of persons with disability, and to show you the, the video itself. So as providers, we all know what's available for our patients um, can be probably used in multiple uh, venues, not only in our spinal cord, but um, atraumatic, traumatic spinal cord injury folks, possibly in our MS folks as well. So, so why a new video? First of all, why did we develop and seek for a new video? Well, number one would be the bottom one, the current video that was um, used, or the most recent video that was used was early 1990s. This is like back when um, I had big hair, Stroman had hair. Um, so about 15 years ago, um, the video predates erectile dysfunction medications, and it was really heavy malfocused. And spinal cord injury is, it's a four to one ratio, but really women that were watching the video kind of felt appalled. They felt that it was all about men. Um, other reasons why a new sex health video for spinal cord injury, really there's limited information for, for our patients and for ourselves as providers on education regarding sexual health. Um, for some providers, it's a very um, discomforting topic to discuss. Um, I've, I've had colleagues say, Lisa, can you come in and talk to this person? Because I really have hard time just even saying some of those words. So, so we need to be able to open the door, and this video can do that. Um, also, we do have some great patient education materials on sexual health written materials, and they really don't capture the emotion that, that's important in um, sexual health as a whole. So we um, did a little work, uh, worked especially through our patient education department, and thank you to them on their collaborative efforts, um, and they do a fabulous job at helping start a program and start a, a planning committee. So we had two of our spinal cord docs, uh, two of us uh, rehab CNSs, um, in spinal cord injury, uh, Dr. Rowe, uh, two patient education specialists. Uh, Sharon Chambers was a big driver of this as well at the time, and then our video director. And I think we sat at a table like at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, coffee at hand, talking about what should be in the video. And, you know, we thought how-to topics. It should be a how-to, kind of a manual of how to do this. And, you know, barriers to sex, such as erectile dysfunction, bowel and bladder issues, dysreflexia issues, we thought were the important things. Um, fertility, both male and women issues regarding fertility. Positioning, now this took a long time of discussion, let me tell you. In the uh, old uh, video, there's very implicit or explicit um, captures of, of sexual interaction in the shower, in the wheelchair. And that was a little distracting as patients were trying to learn about sexual health. In fact, the, the snippets were a little bit longer, and, and a lot of people didn't quite get the content of the video. So we spent a lot of time going, well, how do we help people understand, you know, the options they can consider um, regarding uh, intercourse and how, you know, positioning, and how do we do this? Do we get actors? Do we do illustrations? How do we do this male-wise and be, you know, so offering some options to people. We do have, you know, illustrations in our uh, spinal cord injury manual, so there are some illustrations. Um, feminine issues, male versus uh, female issues with sexual health in general were things we've talked about. And then eventually we thought, well, you know, maybe we should throw something in about dating and relationships. So at the end of our discussion, we thought, okay, here are the the things, the messages we want to portray. Um, affirm that people are still sexual beings after spinal cord injury, instill hope, and convey intimacy without being explicit. Again, back to the positioning thing. 
But wait a minute. What do the patients really want to know? That was my question. How do, how do we get to what the patients want to know? We ask them. And so I actually called patient-centric care. And this has been a, a hot topic and useful in, at Mayo Clinic probably in the last five years. Um, I've used it as well in other um, patient and materials and the development of. And it's really asking the patient, what do you need to know? If it's revised stuff, what's missing that you need to know? Or what do you need, know and we don't need to put in there? So it's really, it's a partnership with patients and families and the providers. And with that, we can improve our health care practice, the service, our education materials, and even our system of care by having patients, consumers, families at the table as we're starting to plan and develop other education materials, programs, services. And really, it's a male way. By incorporating the voice of the patient, we, put, we perfect our primary value that the needs of the patient come first. How do we know if we're providing good service to patients without asking them what is good service? So I'm going to turn it over to Dan at this point. Thanks. So we, uh, we then started thinking about, well, who do you want to choose to bring into these focus groups, and how do you go about making that uh, decision? So we really decided, Lisa and I talked, as we talked with um, Sharon Chambers from Patient Ed and said, well, we really want to balance and we'd like to have some differing age ranges, dis distances out from initial rehab. We'd also like to have a balance of male and female and also levels of injury. We'd like to have both uh, tetraplegia as well as paraplegia represented in the groups. But other than that, um, then we started thinking about individual personalities and uh, you know, the patients that we've worked with in the past about who might be representative of those groups. Then the, the purpose of the course of focus groups is this, this idea of developing patient-centric care. And the idea is um, uh, we really want these groups to really develop the content and, the, and also the kinds of images that we'd like to put on um, um, video education material. Uh, we decided the best place to have this was not in an office nor in a, in a building in the Mayo Clinic. And we uh, had we invited them into sh actually Sharon Chambers' home, uh, essentially uh, to uh, have some after dinner food and discussion to make it very informal and comfortable because you, given such a anxiety laden topic, you'd really like your consumers to be at ease and feel like they can really share what was most important to to uh, to talk about. And then we decided on um, uh, what kinds of questions uh, we wanted to try to have answered. Can you hit this little button here? Yes. So we had two focus groups. Uh, each of them we met for uh, 90 minutes. And the first group was three consumers, two females and a male. And these were all paraplegia, uh, paraplegic uh, levels. And all of them had partners at the time of their injury. So that was a, this was a situation where they had a partner because that was another issue about who to invite. Uh, are they already partnered or not in terms of the issues that might be present? Second group, uh, five consumers and one spouse was was um, attended, and you can see the balance of the two female, three male, and the balance of two para, three uh, tetra. But also the patient education specialist uh, joined these groups, uh, Sharon, and the video director, uh, Tom Williams. And we actually have, uh, before we actually show the video, we have uh, the video of Tom Williams, and we actually uh, kind of turned the tables on him. I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment. But uh, we, uh, he does not have a disability. And we're very curious, a very sensitive and a careful educator. And so we actually turned the tables on him, and we have a five minute video of, of us interviewing him about what his thoughts were about a sexual health video for individuals with disabilities. Phenomenal person to work with. And then the, uh, we gave ourselves the titles of project coordinators for this. And so we were at both of these groups too. So the initial questions that, uh, that came from the uh, planning group. Uh, we, we really wanted to know uh, what their experience had been. So these are some of the things we posed to them. Uh, what did they think of the education that they had already provide, been provided? What, what was good? What was bad? What could we include? Uh, what was really uh, kind of uh, rank order? What do you have to have in a video versus what might be uh, optional or of secondary importance? Um, what are the things that you left the hospital, the questions that you left the hospital with uh, that weren't answered? And so we want to make sure to capture those uh, in a video uh, in terms of importance. Um, in the years that you had your disability, 
what would you like to pass on to other consumers that you wish you knew when you were leaving, especially this focus of early on in the course of the injury? And also, what should we not include? Things that, from this previous video, there are certain things that maybe should not be included with the early on in the process of sexual health education. So those are some of our initial questions. And so these are some of the responses from Group 1 that they really would like to have known before they left the hospital. And you can see some of them are very practical in terms of incontinence, becoming pregnant, but many of them have to do with relationships as well as orgasm changes. But many of them have to do with inspiring creativity, of talking about developing relationships and communication skills. So it seems like the technical part was of perhaps equal importance to the communication part and the assurance that, indeed, it might be possible to resume relationships after spinal cord injury. So these are some of the specific questions. How long did it take to resume sexual activity? And these were some of the responses. Right away, within two weeks, would have been right away, but was living at my parents' house. So you can see just from those responses that sexuality is really something that is very much on people's minds. Even though there's many, many other issues, it's very much on people's minds. If a friend was newly injured, you can see the kinds of responses. Tell them, the spouse, not to be afraid. Ask of any restrictions to sexual activity. How is it going to feel in terms of insecurity of my new body image, in terms of how my partner or spouse is going to respond? Also talk about how relationship aspects, emotionality, intimacy, becomes even more important. And some practical aspects about how long did it take to actually get and maintain a usable erection. So there's, but you can see it goes the gamut from physical to emotional and relationship issues that are very, very important. Some of the quotes, group one quotes, if someone told me in the hospital I was still a sexual being, I wouldn't have believed it. You can see how frightening this issue is about being stripped of your sexual identity. Before the injury, I took intimacy for granted. It's more meaningful now and has taken on a new meaning. So an expanded sense of sexuality. From group two, quotes on relationships. My relationship with my girlfriend ended. My advice is that this is a life-changing event. It takes a while for your head to get around it. And it's not uncommon for relationships to end after the onset of a spinal cord injury, even before the person leaves the unit. So there can be huge losses, not just the loss of physical function, but of a very important relationship. I attract a better quality of relationship now. There's nothing superficial about it. So it shows you how post-injury relationships can be all the more powerful and enduring. On sexual activity, sex was definitely on my mind. I wondered how it was going to work. There are a million things out there. Try it. You need to be patient and learn your body. And your body has to adjust. The last one was, it's important to remind yourself that nothing happens fast. So sexuality and sexual activity is now a planned activity rather than a spontaneous activity the way it was before. And sometimes that's very hard for people to appreciate those changes. So the topics that were suggested to be included in the video, you can see really focused a lot more on body image, self-esteem, communications, relationships and dating, and then the actual physical part of resuming activity. But that really was minor. Lisa put this presentation together. And this is, I don't know if you, does anybody know what this picture is from? A new TV reality show called Push Girls. And their motto is, if you can't stand up, stand out. So this is out on the, I think the Sundance. And it's available online. But essentially, it's a very positive statement about sexuality from a wheelchair base. 
and uh, very much as uh, what has been happening with sexuality in our culture and sexuality and disability, that people are affirming their sexual identities and reclaiming it and expecting society to be respectful of that as well. And they're going to be coming to guess who? They're physicians. And they're going to be expecting, and healthcare providers, and they're going to be expecting you to be knowledgeable because they've got some questions. And so, again, that's one of the reasons that we produced the video was to try to address these questions that have, uh, have been raised. Uh, so key messages that we wanted to get into the video from the uh, focus groups was convey importance of self-esteem and self-confidence, critical, encouraging people to get out and meet other individuals, the importance of intimacy, exploring possibilities, both relationship as well as uh, physical, what might be possible. Uh, communication is critical and reaffirm to people just as well as the self-esteem, but that healthy and successful relationships do indeed happen after spinal cord injury. Many people essentially said, I can't believe this is possible. They were so unconvinced that this might be possible that they left the hospital that way, feeling that low to their self-esteem. So let me shift to uh, this. Now we're going to interview Tom, who, uh, and we want to see what he thought of this process, because he is the creative person that took these key messages and then was to turn it into uh, a video. And so we wanted to know what processes went through his mind as he did that. And then there would be chapters that were a little bit more how-to, a little more informational. We'd have a chapter on positioning, demonstrating positions in a kind of PG-rated way. We thought that we would have uh, something on common dysfunctions and how to deal with it. Maybe a chapter on sexual aids, introducing people to sexual aids. Our first step, though, was to have a couple of focus groups with people who had been living with spinal cord injuries for a while, and a spouse or two was thrown into that mix. And they were almost universally negative about the idea of how-to programs. One of them told us, I am not 12 years old. <laughs> and somebody said, it's a lot more fun to figure that stuff out on your own. We, we really don't need a video about that. But they were very, very positive about the idea that we could do a program that would be encouraging and uh, suggest to people that they need to be proactive in finding people to have relationships with, uh, that relationships can be maintained after a spinal cord injury, um, that you need to have high self-esteem. Um, as you go out into the into the dating world. So I spoke to no fewer than 14 people um, on the phone. Some of those people um, did not have particularly happy stories to tell, which would be the case in the general population if I called 14 people and asked them about their, their history of relationships. Um, some of them had uh, married their personal care attendants, and we didn't really feel like we wanted to model that as a potential solution for people who are new to, to a spinal cord injury. But we did find, finally, five people who we thought were just ideal. It was a very good mix of people. We had three married couples. Uh, in one case, the injury had occurred after they were married and after they had a child. In another case, the injury had occurred uh, before they, they were married and before she got pregnant. And in a third case, these people had uh, not been together very long, and they were pregnant at the time that we, uh, we did the interview. There were two single women, one of whom had been sexually active and uh, the other of whom had been in relationships and dated but had chosen not to be sexually active. So it, it was a nice, broad diversity of, of people. They were spread out over three states, but it was well worth driving some distance to, to get these interviews. One of the things that I heard from a lot of the people I talked to was that they didn't get much education about sexuality after their spinal cord injury. Certainly, they said right after the injury, it was not necessarily top of mind for me. I wasn't asking a lot of questions. But when it was time for me to ask questions, they said, I, I kind of had trouble getting answers. Um, a number of them said, you know, my family physician was just really embarrassed by those questions, um, just kind of looked at the ground and shuffled his feet and didn't really want to have that conversation. One of the things that I think a program like this can accomplish is it can open the door to that conversation. Um, people can see this program. They can realize there are people out there talking about this. I've got questions after seeing this program. They can turn to their provider and, and ask the questions that perhaps they would have been a little shy to ask otherwise. When we had finished our interviews, we had transcripts pulled, and I did a paper edit, and that gets you started in the edit suite, but there's a lot of creative work to be done in the edit suite. Things that look good on paper don't sound so good. You find that your program is 40 minutes long, so you start cutting, 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 because you really only want it to be seven minutes to a chapter, probably at the most. After I had cut together the patient comments, I shared that with the providers, and we asked ourselves, what information is not in here that needs to be in here? 
Um, if you're going to educate people about spinal cord injuries and sexuality, there's some topics you really have a responsibility to cover, like autonomic dysreflexia and uh, the fact that you can get pregnant after a spinal cord injury. We decided rather than write a script and have an actor read that, we would uh, interview providers, specifically a rehabilitation psychologist and a clinical nurse specialist. So they came into the studio, they did some sound bites, um, we incorporated those in the program, and then they shared it with their colleagues who had some good advice, and uh, we went back in the studio and fine-tuned them a little bit. So in the end, we were able to get all of the, the information we wanted in here without actually having to script anything, which would have been much more artificial. When we finished our interviews, we had a 33,000 word transcript, and the final script of our edited program is 2,300 words, and that's kind of typical to do that sort of narrowing down. You don't want to overwhelm people with information. I'm very pleased with the program as it turned out. Um, it is not what we thought we were going to do when we started, but the focus group was invaluable in steering us in a better direction, and I really feel we've created a program that will help people as they start a new life with a spinal cord injury and help them feel very positive about, about their future and about the opportunities that are out there. And this is entirely due to the, the people we interviewed. The, the patients were so generous in sharing their stories. They were so insightful. Um, it, it really made for a program that I think will, will be memorable to people who watch it and help them in their lives. So I'm going to switch back here. Um, and as Tom alluded to in his talk there, it did end up becoming a, a video completely different than we initiated. As you recall, that 7 o'clock meeting, we spent lots of time on positioning, going, boy, how are we going to, how are we going to show this? And the focus group members were like, that is like part of the fun of figuring things out. We don't need to know that. You don't have to show us that. We can figure that out for ourselves. So we were really on the wrong path. And so by pulling the focus group together, we have a really much different video. So as, as Tom wrapped things up in, in the edit suite, um, we had a few video drafts that I um, brought to several different groups. So I brought it back to some of our focus group members. Um, they loved it. They thought we addressed all the concerns they were talking about and wanted in the video. Um, showed it to spouses and persons with new injuries that were on the rehab unit. So they gave us a couple of suggestions that you'll see in the video really is, you know, tell me about when their injury was and, and what, are, are they paraplegia, are they quadriplegia, I couldn't tell. For those of us, it's kind of obvious. Um, and then to the spinal cord injury committee to make sure, you know, we captured um, some of the medical issues and the concerns um, appropriately. And I have to say, Dan and I went to the video suite three times. It was hard wearing the same outfit three times in a month. So, <laughs> personally. Okay, so, on to the video. So this is our opportunity to share with you what we have produced. And I hope, there's two chapters, so I'll be, I think we'll have to toggle on to, and... Hopefully our AV guy can keep this in. So when I did this last time, it worked just fine. Is that too loud now? Is it too loud? Okay. No sleeping. Last time, just sort of leaned on to my baby guy. There you go. All right, and then the magic box to come back and help us. Okay. 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 Okay.
be out with friends or be at a wedding and people will come up to me and will say, so can you have kids? And I'll just kind of giggle and they'll be like, what? And I'm like, no, I know your main question is, can you have sex? <laughs> you, you don't want to really know if I can have kids. You want to know if I can have sex. People with spinal cord injury are still sexual beings. They still have the same needs as they did prior to their spinal cord injury. I still have the same thoughts about sex routinely, just like any other male does. Sexuality and the issue of concerns about sexual health are applicable to individuals no matter what their age, their gender, their sexual preference, their religious background, if you're liberal or you're conservative, your racial background. This is a universal aspect of being human. I immediately was asked out by people, yet I was really scared. Like, I didn't know how it would work. It's scary for a lot of our folks with spinal cord injury to go back out in the community, to go to church services, go shopping, and have other people see them, and to feel, again, like a man and a woman. Yeah, I would say nervous. I but also, nervous. like, <laughs> oh, okay. She wasn't nervous. <laughs> I was a little nervous, I guess, just to see how, how things went and stuff. But afterwards, it was fun. <laughs> and I started going into the dating websites, and at first, I didn't say anything about my injury because I thought, um, would they accept that? Would I accept it? The nice thing about the chair, it almost makes things easier for you dating. It weeds out the jerks. The people who just who want things or are shallow or aren't really that good of people, they don't want to date you. Good. See ya. I learned that there was actually good guys out there. They really need to have and build their self-confidence. They have to be confident in how they approach people and also be approachable. I honestly was expecting people to come to my dorm room door, knock on it and say, want to be my friend? And I was like, that isn't going to happen, Tasha. Like, if you want to meet people, if you want to have friends, you're going to have to go out. You're going to have to be involved. I was attracted to her, so I asked her to come help me check the mail, and it just went from there. I got involved with groups on campus through my major, through music, I joined the choir, and I then I started meeting people, then I started having friends. Oh my gosh, he is so hot. Like, every time we would see him, she would always say that, and then, and then he Facebooked me, and he goes, hey, are you the girl that helped me get the mail? Like... He emailed me and then then you asked me out on a date. I was pretty shocked. It was exciting. I can remember the first time that we actually kissed. He was so nervous that he was shaking. And I thought, that's my role, that's usually me. One time we met up and then I just couldn't shake him with a stick. The, the next, next the winter. next December, yeah, we moved in together so no, eight the months. Next, the next winter we got engaged. At the time of my accident in 2006, I was married to my wife, Amanda, and we have my daughter, Ashley, who was one year old at that time. The first year, really, I, I was expected myself to function the way I used to function, and it just wasn't going to happen. And um, once I got past the point of expecting that, it helped because I started to find other solutions. And within a year or two, I found a solution that really helped us a lot. The discovery is all about realizing that sexuality is far, far more than the sexual response cycle and the physiology of achieving an orgasm. Look at other options. Is it all penetration or is it just, you know, touching and kissing and caressing bodies? It's still a special connection between you and somebody else. And if they take the time to make you mentally feel wanted and needed, that's still love. I don't know what your sexual life is going to be like. You've got to invent it. You've got to experiment. You've got to figure out what works and doesn't work for you. You have to know yourself what you like before anybody else is going to know. It's really turning into your senses and finding out 
Um, what, what, what are the feelings going on? What are my sensations? What are the new zones of, of excitement? That information really then equips you when you do uh, desire to have a partner to be able to explain to that partner, this is how my body works after spinal cord injury. My feet are one of the most sensitive things and you don't give them foot rubs. I know. <laughs> Not a big fan yeah, of feet. feet kind of <laughs> <laughs> I'll live with it. Always practicing safe sex techniques is vital. Not only for sexually transmitted diseases, but also pregnancy. They may falsely believe, well, since I'm not experiencing orgasm, somehow uh, uh, I don't have to worry about the possibility of pregnancy. Erroneous. Yes, we are going to have a baby, and I'm 17, I'll be 17 weeks pregnant tomorrow. He wanted to hear it for himself from my doctor that it was okay for me to have a baby. Women that are, are at the age of becoming pregnant really should consult their obstetrician before considering pregnancy and really have a good communication with their obstetrician, their family provider, and their spinal cord injury provider. I had to figure out how I could be an independent mother. The changing table just has some open spots at the end so I can get underneath it. The car seat will flip around 180 degrees so I can put her in straight on and then flip her sideways. There is nothing I can't do. I just have to figure out different ways to do it. She's six years old and uh, she enjoys soccer and other sports and I try to participate in whatever I can. We still play football. She'll tackle me and and we have lots of fun together. So there's plenty of opportunities to still be a dad and have lots of memories to share. Sexuality and sexual health are critical to uh, a sense of, um, of wholeness, a sense of, of connection to other people, and goes to the core identity of who individuals are. I very much look forward to having an intimate and great sex life when I get married. Don't be yeah, shy don't be about shy it, because you're going to try things that you never even thought of doing. I found myself being so comfortable around them that um, it, nothing that should have been an issue like it used to be was an issue anymore. I feel like I'm able to fulfill all of my wife's needs in um, most regards, so I am very happy with where we're at now. critical back burner issue that starts, I think, from day one in the intensive care unit is, can I really become a sexual person or become the same sexual person I was before? Initially, after spinal cord injury, we want to make sure your spinal fusion is well healed, any um, tissue that was operated on is well healed. Thus, consult your spinal cord team or th your ortho surgeon before returning to sexual activity. Once everything is healed, and you've gotten that approval, it is definitely safe to return to sexual activity. One of the biggest anxieties that individuals have after spinal cord injury is really not knowing how their body will work if they want to become sexually active. It's just not going to be the same. And, uh, and until you get past the, the point of expecting it to be the way it was, um, it, it's not going to be fun. A common problem after spinal cord injury is erectile dysfunction. Find something that that you think will work for you or make your body function the way you want. Talk to your doctors, obviously, and see if they have solutions. Using a vibrator to increase the stimulation uh, uh, to the genitals to try to get an erection. Um, using a sheath, using a vacuum pump, using erectile dysfunction medication, either injected or taken orally. All these are potential ways of dealing with erectile dysfunction. The issue is to talk to your health care provider to see what might be best for you. Women do have two specific issues after spinal cord injury. They have a change in their lubrication 
which may not occur or not be significant enough for um, penetration. The other issue is some women do not achieve orgasm or have a difficult time achieving orgasm or sensing orgasm. Even though you might be turned on, your body doesn't respond like that downstairs. There are lubrication um, gels on the market that you can buy over the counter. I would avoid the warming gels as these women that have limited sensation may not feel the warming product. Um, as for orgasm, again, it's, it's trial and error, it's positioning, it may, the person might need to use additional devices such as a vibrator to help with stimulation. There's many, many devices that are used by the able-bodied population in order to uh, pleasure the, either themselves or their partners. And those devices are just as applicable and useful in individuals who have spinal cord injury as they are in the uh, non-disabled population. The strap-on solution seemed to work the best for me. That way I can leave my indwelling catheter in and put the strap-on on and, and make sure everything's routed just right before we start. And um, I get myself all ready in bed and uh, then then I have my wife come join me. Using any kind of devices may alter pressure or produce shear and friction. So after sexual activity, one should really be watchful of their skin and assess their skin afterward. Always be mindful of using external lubricant that can minimize uh, friction in terms of uh, sexual activity. There's lots of different pillow wedges that people can use to position themselves a little more accurately and appropriately or even just what works for them. And so they're positioned better without having to worry about extra friction or pressure on, on bony prominences. What kinds of positions would work for me and my partner and which really aren't very functional, that's a, a piece of the learning that has to occur. He knew what I could and couldn't, you know, do. He watched me, he wasn't, wasn't scared to bend my leg or pull it. I'm usually on top. Yeah sit in a chair sometimes. Just regular missionary, different leg positions from um, spreading out to having him hold the legs to me holding, to up more to the chest to have it up on his um, shoulders. It comes back to trying to find out what works for you, taking the time, working with your partner, and being open to trial and error and trying it again. When persons with spinal cord injury at a T6 level or higher are engaged in sexual activity, they need to be aware of the possible response called dysreflexia. Dysreflexia, dysreflexia occurs when there's some sort of negative stimuli being present below the T6 level of their spinal cord injury. The symptoms of dysreflexia may include a pounding headache, stuffy nose, red blotchy skin above your level of spinal cord injury, sweatiness. The problem is, is a dangerously rising blood pressure that can lead to a stroke or death. If you have symptoms of dysreflexia during sexual activity, you want to stop the activity, let the symptoms subside, and then investigate what might be causing the problem. You might want to check your clothing to see if it's pinched. You might want to check and see if your bowel or bladder are full. You might even consider whether or not there's insufficient lubrication during sexual activity in terms of friction to the skin that might be causing the problem. If the symptoms continue despite checking for other causes, stop the sexual activity. Do not resume until you've talked to your spinal cord provider. They in turn can give you a medication, most likely a blood pressure medication, to avoid dysreflexia related to sexual intercourse in the future. So one of the biggest fears that people have is, oh my gosh, could I possibly have a bowel accident? Or, oh my gosh, could I possibly have a bladder accident? Talk about those concerns first. Um, worst case scenarios, if it does happen, what to do? It's not like you meant to. It's not the end of the world. You take care of the issue, and you move on. It happened. It ended up actually being funny, because all of a sudden it was like, oh, Gotta go to the bathroom. What? Gotta go to the bathroom. Oh, you're going to the bathroom. I'm like, I know. So we laughed about it. Sex is a whole lot better when you've reduced anxiety and the persons are comfortable and you can laugh about things.
both the person with the spinal cord injury and the partner, again, need to really be able to think outside of the box and experiment and practice. Part of the fun is uh, figuring out what works. So my yeah. advice for that would be just have fun, keep an open mind, and uh, don't do anything that would hurt you. It'll go nice and easy and gentle and wonderful the first time. Maybe a little awkward, but you'll get it. All right, so the video is available on um, Mayo DVD or Mayo uh, Video on Demand, and then also on DVD through our patient education department. Um, just a few resources. Um, any questions or discussion? Again, we're, we're excited about the product. It definitely turned out different than what we initially thought we were going to produce at the beginning.